so my name's um, I'm the science communication intern this summer, um, and I'm also a graduate student at UWM. Um, my specialty is environmental literature, and in particular, a new field that we're calling the arboreal humanities. Um, so I study trees, um, and in particular, I study the way that we write about trees, the way that we talk about trees, um, all those kinds of things that we can learn about our relationship with them. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the eastern cottonwood, um, which is a native tree to Wisconsin and a lot of the U.S., um, and it generates a lot of conversation, um, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to kind of bring it into our discussion today. Uh, so it's a really fast-growing, deciduous tree, um, and at maturity it's like really large, really spreading impressive um it can sometimes reach up to 150 feet tall so we're talking like really big trees um it is a part of the willow family um uh, which includes poplars alders um all sorts of things like that in addition to the willows that we usually recognize um so what i'm going to do today is i'm going to tell you a little bit of science about the tree um, a little bit of how it fits into culture um, and we're going to toss like a little bit of literature in there as well, uh, just to kind of give us a scope of how the cottonwood affects us um, and affects the ecosystems. So um, to start off with, I thought I would just briefly get us up to speed how to identify a cottonwood in comparison to some of its relatives. Um, so you can see in this photo right here, um, I can also hold up a leaf to my camera if anyone wants to see if we can see that um, again. Um, but you can see that the cottonwood uh, has a very triangular leaf in comparison to other leaves that we might see. Um, and it comes to like a really definite point up on top here. Um, so if you're trying to differentiate it in particular between um, like other asp aspens and things like that, um, that, that is my best way of identifying it through the leaf, is to take a look at that point. Um, and it's got those serrated edges you can see in the photo there that also uh, can help identify it. So um, part of the reason that I want to talk about cottonwoods today is because a lot of people, especially in urban settings, have a lot of feelings about cottonwoods and not all of them are positive. Uh, but it's a really important tree, so I think it's useful for us to talk about uh, where some of that tension comes from. Uh, so a lot of it uh, is something that the cottonwood is pretty well known for, which is its puffy, fluffy, white seeds that it produces in early summer. Um, now for some of us, this is really like magical and beautiful, and it's like snowing in the summer. Um, and to others of us, um, some people see it as kind of a nuisance or a problem. Um, so what this tree is doing right now is um, actually pretty interesting. Cottonwoods are dioecious, and that means that there are male individuals and there are female individuals. Um, and only the female cottonwood trees are actually the ones that produce the tough. Um, so I've got a picture up here of what the male catkins will look like. Um, so those little red or yellow guys will produce the pollen that will then fertilize the female flowers, and then those produce this cotton fluff. Um, and the cotton is a strategy that the tree has for spreading its seeds really long distances. Um, so it, the seed is basically attached to these little white hairs, and those allow it to float on the wind sometimes as far as 100 miles. So this is a really good strategy for the tree to spread itself out, try to find new homes for its seedlings. Um, and and uh, as a result, this is one of the first trees sometimes to establish itself um, in disturbed and damaged areas. Um, so in some of our parks that have a history of being a little bit polluted or something like that, um, we can see cottonwoods taken over, being really strong there, regardless of those kinds of history. Um, now, it's really interesting. One online nursery that I was looking at as a part of my research um, suggested that this tree was literally not urban approved. It had a category 
and Cottonwood was a solid no for them for urban settings. Um, and I think it's really interesting to talk about some of these tensions. You know, a lot of people see the fluff as beautiful. Other people see it as a nuisance, something they have to unplug from air conditioners and stuff like that. Um, but the tree is also sometimes associated with like damage to structures. Um, it has very brittle wood, um, so it snaps really easily. Um, so if you want to plant cottonwoods, um, I think it's important to like put them in places where that isn't going to be as much of a problem. So we wouldn't want to plant a cottonwood like right directly next to your house, um, just in case one of those big boughs were to crack. Um, and the reason that the wood is so brittle is because it's such a fast growing tree. Um, so the, those two kind of go hand, on, hand in hand very often. So uh, the quality that we might be seeking in a tree that grows and matures really fast um, can also produce some of these side effects that we need to think about um, just when we're dealing with cottonwood in our everyday lives. Um, so I think it's also really interesting um, to talk a little bit about cottonwood roots. So cottonwoods like to live in really moist environments, ones that are prone to flooding. Um, so their roots actually remain really near the surface of the soil. Um, and the reason for this is that if a flood happens, their roots still have access to oxygen if they're really near the top of the soil. Um, and that's important because plant roots need access to oxygen as a part of their aerobic res respiration processes. Um, so these allow the plant to use that oxygen, turn it into cellular energy, and use it in um, the metabolic processes that the plant goes through. Uh, and this is really important, especially during those times when the tree doesn't have as much access to sunlight to photosynthesize. So if you've ever wondered what trees do like at night or if it's been cloudy for a few days, um, this is one of the strategies that they have to still keep producing the things that the tree needs to live. Um, so cottonwood roots very close to the top of the soil there because they want that oxygen, even if the soil underneath them is completely saturated. Um, however, this does mean that like their roots are really close to the surface of the soil. So a lot of people um, take out cottonwoods from like sidewalks and stuff like that or pathways um, because they think that they'll damage with their roots. Um, and this also means that they do tend to have an increased likelihood of like being uprooted or toppled over in storms. Um, which a lot of people think is a bad thing, but it makes really good habitat for wildlife that might want to use that tree, even if it's dead. Um, so that's something that we can think about as well when we're taking in these cottonwood ideas. Um, so now, I think it's really important now that we've talked about um, some of the things that people don't like about cottonwoods, um, to kind of dig a little bit into uh, the good things. Okay, we're still good? Okay, um, so we'll dig a little bit into the good things about cottonwoods and why we want them to exist in our ecosystems. Um, so one of the things that we should think about when we're talking about cottonwoods is that this is a really crucial species to Wisconsin ecosystems. Uh, the National Wildlife Federation recently released a list of keystone species for our region of, of the U.S., um, and the eastern cottonwood is included on that list. Um, so if you're not familiar, keystone species are critical to the food web of local ecosystems. Uh, they're often really necessary for a lot of animals, uh, insects, birds, uh, everything to survive. And if those get removed from areas, they can cause a ripple effect, um, which is really detrimental to a lot of different species. Uh, so according to this list, the eastern cottonwood supports 249 caterpillar species, uh, which is like a really, really high number. Um, and this makes it really vital to native insect populations, which in turn provide food for 
insectivorous birds and other things that might be eating those butterflies and moths. Um, so the caterpillar I've got up on the screen right here turns into the viceroy butterfly, which might look familiar to some of us. Um, this is just one example of a caterpillar that relies on cottonwood pretty heavily. Um, and I just always think it's fun to note how much the viceroy looks like a monarch butterfly. Um, but the way we can tell the difference here is there's just a little line right across both of the bottom wings there. Monarchs don't have that. So if you're ever wondering what the difference is, that's it. Um, so these and tons of other caterpillars, insects, everything like that, uh, really rely on cottonwood as a food source and a home. Um, and through their participation in the life cycle of so many of these little tiny critters, um, we see the cottonwoods impact like stretch through the entire food chain. Uh, we can also think of mammals like white-tailed deer who can browse and forage on it, uh, beavers like to chew on it. There's lots of um, animals that are going to use this tree for whatever they need. Um, and I think one of the most adorable things that happens um, is that birds very frequently will use the cottonwood fluff for a nesting material. So here we've got a yellow warbler um, just chilling in his little nest. You can see the cottonwood fluff kind of sticking out there. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like the comfiest nest to me. Full of cottonwood fluff. Very nice. Um, and it's also important for cottonwoods to exist, uh, especially along riverbanks and things like that, uh, because they can really help decrease erosion on the soil uh, because their roots are so shallow and so spread out. Um, they can really decrease some of the uh, problems that can sometimes happen in waterways. Um, so these are only a few of the reasons that cottonwoods are really important. Um, but I think it's worth it to think a little bit about like our UEC branches, all of them have cottonwoods in them. Um, so when we're talking about our urban spaces, uh, it's, it's important for us to exist here and have places for cottonwood to thrive and uh, places for it to live. So that's pretty cool. Um, in addition, cottonwoods have captivated human imagination for centuries as well. Uh, so many indigenous tribes across the United States tell stories about cottonwood trees. Um, and for many people, these trees are really important to their communities and considered sacred. Um, and in one story that's told by Dakota elder Mary Louise Defender Wilson, I'll link this story in the chat after I'm done with my presentation. It's really cool. Check it out. Um, so in this story, the cottonwood was chosen as the dwelling place for a curious star who heard the, the noise of a human village, the singing, the dancing, all that, and the star just wanted to be a part of it. Uh, so he made a deal with the rest of the stars that um, he could live there as long as he hid himself. So he chose to hide in a cottonwood tree. And uh, this belief comes directly from, as you can see on the screen, the little stars that you can find within the branches of a cottonwood tree. Um, and the picture on the left, I was actually successful at finding a really good example of this at the Riverside Park location. Um, so if you see cottonwoods in existence somewhere, uh, do yourself a favor here and see if you can snap a few branches in half, take a look and see if you find a star. Um, this is a really cool thing um, the, the star results as, uh, because of the pith that's on the inside of the twig. And the pith is responsible for carrying and distributing nutrients throughout the tree and to the leaves. Um, so this, this tree just happens to make it in this star-like structure. Um, and we can see many different tribes have noticed this, commented on this, created their own stories to go with it. Um, and hey, Emma. Yeah. Um, we're still looking at a photo um, of the monarch. Oh. And I wonder if you have meant to kind of kept clicking through for us. I did. Is it not sharing correctly? Hmm. Let me try to stop sharing and I'll start sharing again. Hey, 
see. How about now? Now we see it. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. So thank you because this is a really cool photo. I wouldn't want you guys to miss this. Um, but yeah, so you can definitely see the the star that the pick makes right in there. Um, and yeah, a lot of people tell stories about this. This is very important to a lot of cultures. Um, and it's also just a really cool thing to pay attention to and experience when you're dealing with cottonwoods uh, in our local ecosystems. Um, so this tree is also um, really interesting in that it has a lot of uses for indigenous people. Um, it creates this like sticky yellow resin, which contains salicin, which is a compound that behaves a lot like aspirin. Um, so people can make it into medicines. Um, and actually the brittle wood that's so reviled by some homeowners, um, you know, in urban settings is actually really good for making dugout canoes and stuff like that. Um, so it's interesting to see those things kind of existing differently culturally. Um, okay, so, did it switch or is it stuck? It did. It did. Okay, sweet. Um, so cottonwoods have also been important for colonizers. Um, when Europeans came and were settling, uh, in, in particular, the middle of the U.S., uh, cottonwoods were really big uh, landmarks, things that people could focus on and tie into and see as like a source of celebration almost. Um, if you see a cottonwood out on the hot plain, um, a lot of people got really excited for shade. And it was also a really good source of identification of places where water was available. Um, so if you see a cottonwood from a great distance across this vast plain, um, you can head toward it and you can basically know that water is going to be there. Um, so cottonwoods over time became like meeting places, landmarks. Uh, a lot of people built their homesteads around places where cottonwoods existed um, because they were an indication that there were resources there um, that could be looked at, um, taken advantage of. So that is a really great way we can start to see the cottonwood affect us. Um, and I've just got a couple of examples here to go with this of a couple people that are interesting to look at in terms of how they interacted with cottonwoods. Um, so the first one is botanist John George Jack. And you gotta love a guy who has three first names. Um, but he was a very prominent lecturer in dendrology, who studied trees in 1896. Um, and he once found a cottonwood in Montreal that inspired him so much. Um, he took samples from it uh, and brought them all the way back to Boston to propagate them, uh, which is a considerable distance. And it shows like how much this man loved this tree. Um, but an interesting thing is that the, the tree that really inspired him was a male cottonwood, so he couldn't uh, grow things from seed with that tree that he really liked, but he did collect seeds from female cottonwoods that were really near that male cottonwood, so uh, they're very likely related to the tree that he loved, and some of the trees that he planted are still in existence in Boston today, uh, which is kind of cool. But uh, the real thing that I want to say about Jack uh, is that he, it's, it's claimed that he could identify trees by the way that the wind sounded in their leaves. So he could close his eyes and he would know that a cottonwood was near because of the way it sounded. Um, and while this, this does seem a little far-fetched, I'm not sure if I totally believe that, uh, it brings up a really interesting point about cottonwoods, um, which is that they have a flat leaf stem. So instead of uh, the round ones that most trees have, this one is flat. And what that means is the leaf, basically, it can flop over any direction it wants. Um, and when it's windy, that leaf is just going crazy in the wind and clacking against all of its neighbors. Um, so if you're under a cottonwood and a gust of wind comes through, they actually make this really delightful, uh, like, whispering sound. 
uh, that's a little bit more pronounced than the kind that we would get from other trees because the leaves are clacking together quite a bit more. Um, and we can also use uh, the influence of this flat leaf stem to help us identify cottonwoods from a long distance. Um, so we can see here in this picture, uh, there are two mature cottonwoods right in the middle of this frame. Um, and we can notice them because they're a little bit lighter colored than the rest of the trees around them. And this is because the cottonwood leaf is dark on one side and primarily light on the other side. Um, so when you look at all the leaves together, like if you're looking from a great distance, those lighter undersides will sometimes be exposed, especially I took this one on a pretty windy day. Um, so you can kind of notice we've got really, really bright green around the edges of the photo. Those are not the cottonwoods. And then in the middle, we see that lighter green, and that's how we can tell those are cottonwoods. Um, that also works for a couple other aspens in particular. Um, so it's just a fun thing to notice when you're out and about. Uh, okay, so the last person I just want to mention real quick, because I am a literature person, uh, is Willa Cather. Uh, so she is a pretty famous American novelist. Um, she's really famous for her, like, novels about pioneer life on the plains in particular. Uh, she was writing in the early 1900s, uh, but she lived from, like, 1873 to 1947. Um, and she was a writer who was just fascinated with trees. Trees are really, really a focus of a lot of her um, writing. And she is very specific sometimes about which tree she's talking about at which time. Um, so her novel, A Lost Lady, is apparently so full of cottonwoods that a lot of literary scholars have suggested that cottonwoods are like their own main character in addition to the human beings in the story. The Cottonwoods are also there uh, taking a very similar position, um, which is kind of cool to see, especially in someone writing in that time period where it wasn't yet necessarily expected that we would seek out um, the perspectives of like individual non-humans existing uh, in the world outside of human beings. Um, so her rural childhood is said to be like a really big reason that uh, she's so focused on trees. Um, and, you know, she was really good at identifying them. She spent a lot of time with them. So she records exactly which species she's talking about in detail in all of her novels. Uh, so if anyone's interested, you can check that out. She's got short stories as well. Uh, it's a pretty good time. Okay. So um, in these last few minutes, I just want to say, um, these are just a few of the reasons that I think it's important to take notice of cottonwood in our communities. Um, and I think it's important for us to seek out opportunities to observe it, to see what's going on, to see uh, what animals are using it, who's eating it, who's living in it, all that fun stuff. Um, and I think that will lead people to want to preserve the places where it thrives. Because like we talked about, um, there are some things that maybe make it not something we'd want to plant directly next to our house in our yard in a city like Milwaukee, but that's why these urban spaces where they can thrive are so important. Um, there's a lot of really important ecological value here, um, and if you can follow the signs, you can find cottonwood at all of our branches, um, and if you do, take some time, snap a branch in half, um, see if you can find a couple of those stars. That's what I got for us today. I'll stop sharing.